Hey guys, welcome to My Catholic Perspective. I am Allie Marie. Today I would typically make this video exclusive to patrons, but I've felt very called to make it public so that we can chat about the death penalty, um, maybe to bring a little bit more awareness to what the Catholic stance is and why, as well as discuss different ways that we can become involved in anti-death penalty uh, activism, so you could say. Uh, so I wanted to kind of chat with you guys. So today I want to go through Jesus's execution, um, Brendan Bernard specifically, seeing as to how he has made headlines and altogether this push to execute federal inmates while the Trump administration is still in power. Um, I want to chat with you a little bit about Sister Helen Prejean, whether or not you have heard of her. She is a best-selling author. Um, she is very anti-death penalty is a huge activist. Um, so I want to chat with you about her and a couple of her books. And then I want to talk about my experiencing my experience facing death, um, albeit not for committing a crime, but just how the threat of imminent death, how that can impact our psyche, how it can just affect our spiritual life in general. So to start, Jesus' execution. Jesus himself was innocent when he was executed. So when I start, you know, getting into like Sister Helen Prejean, right? She project, she protects innocent lives. It is the whole aspect that innocent people end up being executed for crimes that they did not commit. And after they're dead, DNA evidence comes forward or something comes forward that ends up proving this man's innocence or woman's innocence. So in Christ's execution though, he was executed as an innocent next to a thief who was guilty for his sins. But in the last hour, that thief turned to Jesus and asked him for his forgiveness. And he is the one person that we know without any shadow of doubt, the only person that Christ himself stated will be in heaven and is in heaven today. Like we know that Elijah is due to transfiguration. We know about all of this, but as far as saints go, the thief on the cross, like Christ told him today, you will be with me in paradise. So yes, we have Catholic doctrine. We have the process of making someone a saint, of ensuring that we know that they are in heaven. But as far as Christ's words go, the thief is the one person we know is in heaven. So that's one thing, like when we try to look for hope in the death penalty for wrongful killing, for you know, even somebody who is guilty, um, they have a moment that that's what viaticum is for, for those last rites. That's why they exist is for people right before death to say, I am sorry, and to genuinely mean it. I mean, facing death brings about a whole new perspective to say, you know, of self-examination. You talk about the examine at the end of the day that St. Ignatius really uh, pushed and promoted. Um, at the end of the day, we can examine our consciences, but if you know that you're at the end of your life and it is a surefire thing that you're going to die, that examination becomes critical. And with the death penalty, you know, we can see hope within that, that Christ can act in a heart, that he can intervene to ensure that person's salvation, to grant that person salvation. And it, it's possible that without the death penalty, that person wouldn't have come to that point of asking for that forgiveness, of being so convicted on their deathbed um, that that they would actually have gained salvation by the death penalty. So that's one aspect that I look at when I try to look for hope within the death penalty. When I try to look at how could this bring about goodness, I look at how salvation is possible. I look at the thief on the cross and I say, okay, last minute, last rites, like it's possible. So Brendan Bernard is one of the federal inmates that the Trump administration has been pushing. You know, they pushed for him to be executed. There were a lot of 11th hour cries for, you know, a renewed trial, all of these different things, because when he was 18 years old, he committed a crime. Um, he participated in killing two youth ministers. They desecrated their bodies. Um, and ultimately, there were just a bunch of arguments against it. You know, 30 years ago when the trial happened, the the black community was much more likely to receive a severe, a more severe sentence than a white person may have. And, you know, when you're 18, you might make decisions that you wouldn't make because your brain isn't fully formed. You know, your cerebellum isn't fully formed till you're 25. And so the decision-making part of your brain isn't even fully developed at 18. So should he have been tried as an adult and given such a severe penalty, um, 
And so there, there were a lot of these 11th hour cr cries for help that prosecution was trying to like get rid of, right? And ultimately they overcame because Brendan, Bar or, uh, Brendan Bernard did uh, receive a lethal injection and passed away. Um, but his last rites, his last call for help on the cross is, was exactly as that of the thieves on the cross. So we can definitely find hope in the fact that Christ is merciful, that God is a merciful God. And we can hope, you know, that Brendan's sincere apology was enough, which I'm confident that it was. Um, however, I'm not, you know, at the gates. <laughs> but uh, it's just, but this push to execute federal inmates we as Catholics, the, the death penalty is just not supported because it's not up to us. And Sister Helen Prejean, so she is a phenomenal. I have one of her books. It's called The Death of Innocence. And, um, and she's also the number one New York Times bestseller author of Dead Man Walking. And she is still alive and active on Twitter. She is a... <laughs> A person to look up to if and to look to if you're looking for anti-death penalty information I can link her Twitter below but so she's written this death of innocence and she talks about exactly what I mentioned earlier about how innocent people are being executed and after their execution their innocence is found when we think about Christ's execution it took how long when he died like he died and the temple veil split and the Pharisees eyes were open and they said what have we done who did we just kill? Who was that on the cross? And then he rose from the dead and suddenly all of this stuff changes. So there is redemption in death. That is something that I hold closely to my heart uh, when I hear about these devastating situations like with Brendan Bernard, um, where, you know, the judicial system is not always super straightforward. It, it bothers me that somebody could plead not guilty and get a lesser sentence than somebody who's going to plead guilty knowing that their sentence could be worse because they're willing to own up for what they did because they don't want confusion in the judicial system. I don't understand why, like, if you plead guilty to something, why they wouldn't honor that, why that wouldn't be something they would say, wow, you've, you're admitting your sin, you're expressing remorse, this, this, or that. Um, and going with something like that instead of if you like enter a not guilty plea because we, we can get you off on a plea bargain or we can do this or that and there are all these loopholes and I'm sure that Laura over at What Laura Likes, I would actually be intrigued to hear her aspect, her opinion on that since she has a law degree um, and how that looks and what types of studies went into that in law school um, because it really irks me. I really do not care for it. I personally know um, someone in particular that comes to the top of my head that was guilty of something and they pleaded not guilty because they knew that they would get a lesser sentence, that the judge wouldn't be as hard on them. Um, even though there was active evidence against them, the lawyer was somehow able to get it thrown out and it's just like, there should be accountability. There needs to be accountability for our wrongdoings and it's just not, I don't know, I just I struggle with the judicial system. So, so there are obvious flaws when it comes to convicting somebody for committing a crime. Now, there are certain scenarios where DNA evidence is available and it is without a doubt that this person has committed the crime. Um, but even then, we are not to play God. We are to allow this person however much time that they need to find the Lord, even though, you know, like I said, like facing death does give that renewed sense of the examine, of the fullness of last rites. Um, and that can come forward. But Sister Helen Prejean, like I said, like she's just really, really good. I can't recommend like the Death of Innocence more um, because it really is just eye-opening. Um, it seems like maybe we as Catholics would support the death penalty, but there are a lot of reasons why we should be against it and not be condoning it. And my phone is like driving me crazy right now. I have run out of storage two times, three times, while trying to record this video. It makes me feel like the devil really does not want this information shared, so I'm just really trying to push through right now and not get too agitated. I'm planning to upgrade my phone at Christmas time um, with some Christmas gift money, so, whew. But I wanna talk next about my personal experience with facing death. Um, I had to have a brain surgery in 2014. They found a brain tumor. It was really unexpected, out of the blue, no warning signs. Um, and I, the surgery was scheduled about a month after the tumor was found. And 
I had to get everything in order. Like I had to write a will. I had to designate my medical person that would make decisions if I were something were to happen that I wouldn't come awake again. Like how long would I stay on life support? All of those types of questions. Um, and it really did at the same time. And the song is available on my Etsy shop and in video format. I did a music video of the song standing in the valley that I had written and it's, it's all about Psalm 23. It's standing in the valley of the shadow of my death and looking at the valley of the shadow of my death. And it was originally written about addiction. It was originally written about like being stuck in this thing. And, and through the experience of being diagnosed with my tumor, I really saw how cancer and addiction are so simultaneous. Like we are standing in the valley of the shadow of our death with any type of vice that we are holding near and dear to our heart that we can't let go of and Christ is able to redeem us from that. And so with, for me, my whole thing, I believe it's Elizabeth Elliot who had stated, you know, when I die, I would like to be able to stand before Christ and say, I used everything you gave me. And that was my mantra. It still is just like I, God has given each of us individual talents and they're all so different and beautiful and wonderful and conducive to spreading the word of the kingdom. And for me, I just was like, I want to use everything that I have for you, Lord. And when I die, I want to be able to stand before him and say, I used everything you gave me. And so when I was approaching that surgery it was like I had recorded this music I recorded the audio to the music then I got diagnosed and then we recorded the video which had already been scheduled but it, it all kind of got expedited um but I really felt at that last moment I was like I have done everything that I can I've used everything that you gave me I'm utilizing my talents um and you know there's this big push to get it out and then you know I survived the surgery everything was fine and it's interesting how without that imminent threat of death, how things can become dormant. How things can kind of slide off to the side and say, oh, I can do that tomorrow. Oh, I can get to that next week. Oh, I can get that, you know, I don't need to do that now. I'll do, I'll, I'll write that book next year. We're not supposed to delay. Procrastination is not of God. And so when we start, when, when I think of the death penalty, I see a lot of hope in it. I see Christ's redemptive aspect of offering somebody that level of this is your last chance to like make amends. This is like a final peace offering that you can give, um, which is what Brendan Bernard ultimately said. You know, he was like, if, if my death brings their family peace, may it be done. You know, he was willing to, he like accepted this punishment gracefully and graciously and it was you know I don't recall who had posted it there was somebody that spent time with him in his last social gathering that posted all those things that it were their takeaways from hanging out with him for his the last time they would see him was that he was truly sorry and that he just wanted the family to be at peace and if this was going to add to that peace then so be it um so I just I see the hope in it but there is still that aspect of like say that he had been redeemed like what more good could he have done in the world we don't know we don't know what further potential he could have developed when we look at you know people like grandma moses wasn't she 99 when she painted her first painting or mother Teresa, like in her old age saw at calcutta um and like the missionary of charities like all of these things happen later on in life and we don't know what could have become of Brendan Bernard. We don't know what could have become of the other eight federal inmates that were executed before him in this final push. We don't know what could become of those that are still being executed right now as the Trump administration is still in power. But I can tell you that the death penalty is not a Catholic like ideology. It is not something that we should stand behind. It's not something that Christ himself would even condone. And um, I mean, you know, you look at him with the white, the woman who committed adultery and everyone was standing around and he said, he, he who is without sin cast the first stone and everyone put their stones down because we're all guilty of sin. We are all like victims of the fall and we all participate in that as well. And we all make our best effort, hopefully, to get out of that hole and to seek goodness and truth and light. Um, 
And so we just have to just have it at the forefront of our minds that God is loving, he is redemptive, and we do need to protect the lives of all people. Everyone is worthy of dignity and respect regardless of what crime they may have committed when they were five years old or 18 or 52. I don't care. Like, we are all worthy of dignity and respect. And yeah, we, we need to be praying for those that are struggling with respecting that dignity of life. But just understand that there is probably something in our life that we have done ourselves that would be contributing to the degradation of respect for human life. There's probably something we've said or done that has taken away from the respect and dignity of another person. And so we just need to take that, offer it to the cross, offer it up, and um, and use it for the redemption of those who may not have a choice in whether they live or die. So thanks for tuning in today. Um, I'm glad that, you know, I had to delete I deleted three apps every single time that, that told me that my storage was full. So I don't know what's going on with my phone right now. But I'm really looking forward to being able to upgrade. The camera will be a little bit better. And um, and so you have that to look forward to. But really, I recommend Sister Helen Pergine. Please check her out. She's way more educated than me. And I might get with what Laura likes and see if she's willing to do a video on the whole guilty versus not guilty plea. Um, I, she... I don't know anything about it. And she is definitely educated in that arena. So God bless. I pray that God grants you the resources that you need to draw closer to him and in turn to those around you. And I pray that you're able to make it a great day. Have a happy God at Sunday and we'll talk to you soon.